Hello everyone and welcome back to Cobain History. In today's video we are gonna have a look at Monaco and why this microstate survived without being incorporated within a larger power such as France or Italy. We'll also look at how this country was even able to exist, as it's just a sliver of rocky coast, all of which can fit into one picture. Nowadays, of course, Monaco earns its wealth through luxury tourism and finance, but those are both relatively recent ways of earning money, so how was Monaco able to support itself in the past? To find the answer to those questions, we'll start at the beginning. Before we get into the video, I've got an announcement to make. As you might know, I've had a Patreon page for a while now, but I'll now also start using YouTube memberships. I'll also start posting videos around a week early for my patrons and members. And this also means my supporters will be able to comment on videos before anyone else. This will be available from the lowest tier, and at this tier you'll also get access to exclusive videos. And if you're on my Discord server as well, you'll also gain a special role depending on the tier you're on. If you're interested in having more perks, such as your name appearing at the end of the video, or having access to polls in which you can decide which videos I create next, then you can also check out the higher tiers. While the perks for each tier are the same on both platforms, due to YouTube memberships taking a significantly larger share of the revenue, I have made it slightly more expensive on YouTube compared to Patreon, so there is still an incentive to support me on Patreon. This only applies to the higher tiers however, the lowest tier is $1 on both platforms. So if you're interested in supporting me you can either click the join button next to my channel or click the link in the description to find my Patreon page. So now back to the video. Monaco was founded around the 6th century BCE by Greek settlers who, at the time, created colonies all over the Mediterranean. Its original name was Monoikos, meaning single house. This might be referring to the isolated community which would have been inhabiting the area around the Rock of Monaco. Or it could have also referred to a temple of Hercules that might have stood here. No archaeological evidence of a temple has been found here, however, but later Roman scholars like Pliny the Elder and Tacitus both refer to the area as Hercules Monoiki, and even today Monaco's port is still called Port Hercules. Through the ages, the area would come under the influence of a variety of peoples and powers, and by the 11th century, it were the Ligurians who called this region home. In 1191, Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI granted control over the area to the city-state of Genoa, which was the centre of Ligurian culture. As was the case throughout northern Italy at the time, there were two rival factions in the Genoan Republic. The leading families that were aligned with the Holy Roman Emperor were known as the Ghibellines and the other faction which aligned with the Pope were the Guelphs. The ruling family of Monaco, the Grimaldis, descended from Otto Canella, who was a consul of Genoa in 1133 and part of an ancient and prominent family within the faction of the Guelphs. And it was his younger son, Grimaldo, who founded the House of Grimaldi, named after himself, in 1160. In 1215, construction began on a fortress atop the Rock of Monaco by a group of Genoese Ghibellines, with the intention of turning the Rock of Monaco into a military stronghold. They also built up a settlement around the base of the rock to support the garrison that would man and maintain the fortress. This year is often regarded as the start of Monaco's modern history. To draw in residents from Genoa and the surrounding areas, the Ghibellines offered land grants and tax exemptions to new settlers which I also find a nice parallel to the tax haven that Monaco has become today. When fighting between the factions came to a head in Genoa, 
Members of the Grimaldi family, along with a lot of others fleeing the civil conflict, took refuge in Monaco. In 1297, François Grimaldi, alongside his cousin Rainier and their men, captured and took control over the fortress on top of the rock that overlooked the settlement. Legend has it that they disguised themselves as monks to get into the fortress, and that's why on the coat of arms of Monaco it is held up by two monks. Although the capture of the fortress by the Grimaldis was contested for a few years, eventually the Grimaldis established themselves as the lords of Monaco. They weren't an independent nation yet, however, as they were still under the sovereignty of Genoa. Under Charles I, Monaco's domain expanded significantly when the Grimaldis acquired first Mentone in 1346 and nine years later also Rocca Bruna. They developed closer ties with France over the coming century and in 1489 France recognized Monaco as an independent state. With the backing of France, Monaco's sovereignty was indisputable. Their former overlord Genoa was of course not pleased by this, and they tried to retake it several times but were never able to regain control over the fortress. The next king of France reaffirmed its recognition of Monaco by setting up a formal alliance between them. Eventually Monaco and France began having disputes which resulted in Monaco approaching Spain to be put under their protection instead, which Spain accepted in 1524, and a permanent Spanish garrison was stationed in the fortress to deter the French from imposing their authority over the microstate. This put a lot more strain on the Monegasque economy, however, as it was up to Monaco to house and maintain this garrison. Keep in mind that, at this time, Monaco was not yet a principality, just a lordship. But this changed with Honoré II. He became Lord of Monaco in 1604, but in 1612 he decided to start styling himself as Prince of Monaco. In 1633 Spain recognized Monaco as an independent principality. While at this time still a protectorate under Spain, Monaco sought to re-establish its alliance with France, which they succeeded in around eight years later. This is when France also gave its recognition of Monaco as a sovereign principality and agreed to it becoming a protectorate under France once more. The prince was given command of a French garrison, which he used to expel the previous Spanish garrison which were now occupying the fortress. Despite the lack of resources and land, even back then the people of Monaco lived rather well, as their location was an ideal stopping point for ships. As a result, maritime commerce was big in Monaco and profited from taxes imposed on ships on their way to Italy or France. When the French Revolution happened, Monaco wasn't spared though. While retaining their life, the royal family's monetary possessions in France were seized in 1789, and in 1793 French revolutionary forces captured Monaco. They took over the rock, taking everything left in the palace, and selling it at auctions. The palace itself was converted into a hospital and then into a home for the poor. The prince's family was imprisoned but later freed. They were now in financial ruin and several members of the family had to enter the French army in desperation. After the Napoleonic Wars, the principality was reinstated in 1814, but a year later when the borders within Europe were officially decided upon at the Congress of Vienna, Monaco retained its borders, but was designated as a protectorate of the Kingdom of Sardinia. In 1848 the Italian Risorgimento started, which was a conflict which eventually would result in Italian unification. The towns of Mentone and Roccabruna, which had been under the rule of Monaco for half a millennia at this point, 
declared their independence and styled themselves as free cities but still under the protection of Sardinia. They did this in the hope that Sardinia would annex them, and thus these towns could also play a part in the Italian unification, but this was not to be. After two years, the royal family of Sardinia, the House of Savoy, did come in and take over the administration of the towns, but they did not officially annex them. In name only, the towns remained under the sovereignty of Monaco, although they had no control over them. This state of political limbo worked well enough until 1860. The Sardinian king had made a deal with France for them to support his unification of Italy and hold back the Austrians. But as part of this deal, Sardinia would cede the Duchy of Savoy and the County of Nice to France, with the County of Nice being the land that surrounded Monaco. The principality had come to be in a dire financial situation at this time. Mentone and Roccabruna made up 95% of Monaco's territory, and with them no longer under their control, all that was functionally left of the principality was a small portion of rocky coast housing the fortress and the main settlement, which would struggle to support itself. It still had its port, but commerce alone would not bring in enough money to make up for the production within the now self-proclaimed free cities, which had supported the relatively barren centre of Monaco for centuries. With France now at their doorstep and Sardinia moving on to unify Italy, Monaco struck up a deal with France the next year. Monaco officially still owned the rebellious towns, so they would cede them to France in exchange for 4 million francs. In addition to that, France would also recognize Monaco as a fully independent country. A referendum was held in the free cities and they were on board with becoming French. Their names were then also Frenchified, with Mentonay becoming Menton and Roccabruna becoming Roquebrun. Although Monaco was no longer a protectorate, France would later on again become responsible for Monaco militarily, which is an agreement that is still in place today. The 4 million francs they received provided some relief, but the prince knew that to be able to survive long term, a new source of income would have to be established. In 1856, the prince gave permission to set up a sea bathing facility for the treatment of various diseases, as well as to build a casino. The first casino opened in 1862, but it was not a success. The famous Monte Carlo Casino opened a year later, and a hotel was also built. The popularity of Monaco as a gambling hub and a place of tourism only grew slowly, which in part might be due to the area's relative inaccessibility from most of Europe. But that changed in 1868, when a railway link with France was constructed. Now tourists started arriving in droves, and Monaco became an established travel destination. The next big step came a century later, under Prince Rainier III. He would come to define the view that we have of Monaco today, turning the principality into a thriving centre of international finance and business, as well as maintaining its status as a luxury tourist destination. He oversaw the construction of the Fontanavea district, an area completely reclaimed from the sea, which increased Monaco's size by 25%. The port was also upgraded, now allowing more ships to dock, as well as being able to accommodate large cruise ships. If you're interested in learning about how more micronations survive to the modern day, the playlist will be on screen right now. Or if you're interested in more broader history topics, feel free to check out my channel. I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, especially my $25 patron, G. David.